But, you know, um, political parties matter. But we have refused to build political parties. What we have done is created machines to win elections. It reminds you of Richard Daly and machine politics in Chicago. So you win elections. But you need political parties to govern properly. We're getting away with murder, whether we are opposition or government, government for now. But it is not sustainable. What you do when government really doesn't work for the people is that you get so many disaffected people who are taking it and taking it. You get conditions that are leading to inequality in society that's broadening and broadening. And one day, those who have been left out will say, no mass, no more. And the system just comes tumbling. It doesn't matter how you deceive yourself. It's not sustainable. So how do we prevent this system from falling over? Enlightened self-interest says that those people, if they are clever, need to begin to ask themselves, how do we create political parties that create citizens, that make for participation, that make for public engagement, the marketplace of ideas resulting in people-owned processes for progress? Until we can do that. Ah, uh, our democracy will be challenged. Now, that's one aspect. The other aspect, which of course I think is probably an extension of what you've described, is participation in the political parties. Right now, the political parties, you say, are vehicles for winning elections and taking power. Uh, in terms of their membership, you uh, had the experience of being a presidential uh, candidate at some point uh, in the process. And I remember that when I spoke to you then, you, you did talk about the absence of the membership, that you are dealing with a small group of people who have a very definite idea of what they want to do. And if you're not in tune with that idea, mm -hmm. even if it's a very good idea, mm -hmm. that's where it dies. It doesn't even get to be voted upon. Has that changed? Not much, not much. Uh, you see, of, of their own nature, political parties tend to become oligopolies dominated by a few throughout history. Indeed, uh, the famous definition of organization as essentially, coming out from Michel's, who I talked about earlier, uh, he who says organization says oligopoly. It comes from that whole concept that a few people eventually invariably dominate parties. But you see, why it's easy for that to stay in a valuable way is that those parties have defined some principles, some party plans, whatever it is, some set of beliefs that all members are supposed to share. Even if that oligopoly dominates how the selection process and all of that takes place, they are based on certain shared values that have been agreed that and so you have a fight on the party plank on what direction we should take policy and this and this. But we don't even try to do that in Nigeria. Uh, parties have not been about ideas. They have not been about how you govern the people to achieve a certain goal that advances the common good. So that compounds the problem of oligopoly in party uh, organization. So that is the real problem, that our political parties haven't sat down. I mean, you can talk about uh, uh, what I have done, I've tried to do unsuccessfully, though, within a party that I belong to. I've harassed the chairman to death. Look, we need workshops. Just bring all these people that we have elected. There's no money. I said, okay, don't worry about money. I'll go and assemble my friends, Rewane, this person. All of us will do it free. Just come and educate these people about what, what the consequences of their behavior in office is. This is. I tried and tried until I said, okay, I'm not going in. I don't get anywhere here. Are you going to throw your, your hat in the ring again? Ah, uh, let's leave rings out of this now. <laughs> no, well, I, I asked that but, question. But, but, I asked that question because quite a number of people I've spoken to say that part of the problem that we have is that the people with the bright ideas, the robust ideas, the people who can actually make a difference, have not joined the political uh, space in numbers uh, enough to. I, I, make a difference. I, I, I have joined. You joined, but <laughs> and a number of others have also yeah. joined, like you. But the, the mass is still missing because people will still which was say, the very idea of the Nigeria intervention movement. The idea is to bring 
such people in their thousands, if not millions, into the process and to get them to go in and try and dominate these parties so that we can have parties that will work in the interest the of the common good of all. About numbers. Absolutely. Yes, we need to do that. I mean, I've always said to people, look, my life's race is wrong. It's wrong. Um, not seeking but, elective office anymore. I, no, I'm not saying I'm not seeking. But if something that I can do will improve judgment day for me, because it's all about immortality. If something I can do will improve my standing on Judgment Day, I'll be prepared to do it. But for the sake of any accomplishment, my life race is done. That's enough for history to evaluate me. Uh, but you look and you see so much wrong, so much that can be done, and then people come to you and say, look, and you feel some, some guilt. They say, maybe I should, maybe. So, Nothing is ruled out. Nothing can be ruled out. If you have a conscience that you have made an effort to form, and that conscience keeps saying to you, something is wrong, that something you can do can make a difference at, maybe it will make you do certain things. But what I would most like to see is a succession culture in which we can bring younger people with clear ideas into the system and mentor them for the sake of tomorrow. I, I, I'll come back to that in just a moment, uh, because that's what I believe the Center for Values Leadership is about. Um, but this has been a particularly long journey for people like you. You joined government at 27. Uh, and from the story, uh, the research, the background, that you've been saying quite a lot of the things you've been saying since then. And there are people who just throw their hands in the air and say, look, it's OK. I mean, I've said all there is to say. I'm leaving. You've refused to do that largely, and now I think to some extent you've explained why. But how long can that continue? Because other people who made the same decision as you at the beginning have since thrown their hands in the sky and left. You know, I think I, an even in, more interesting way to say this, uh, uh, at some meeting uh, a few weeks ago, Lisa Bokawa told people that I drew him into activism. Because when I returned to the country in 1982, I got together a bunch of intellectuals and created a group called the Congress of Concerned Citizens in 1982. And that's how Olisa Bakoba became an activist, <laughs> you know. Um, over the years, many in that group, because at that time we were all coming back, everybody wanted to come back home and change. I left the U.S. the very day my PhD thesis was turned in, same day. It was done in the morning, in the evening I was on my way back home the kind of excitement in those days, let's go and change our country. Of, at that time, at the time I made this statement, about, I don't know, two, three years ago, I wrote a piece titled, The Generation That Left Town. Yes. Of all of those people in that our group, it was only Femi Aribisala, Felisa Bokoba and I, who were still living in Nigeria at that time. About two others have returned since, that? In, in, from in retirement, <laughs> more, ah, of, that, that, more that, or less. That, 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 <laughs> you know, they what they believe they ought to, they ought to do with their lives. Um, but if you just think of it when your country's finest leave. In fact, emblematic of this whole thing was more than 10, 15 years ago, somebody wrote in the paper, I don't understand why Patu Tom is still in this country. All his times have left. I read that. 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 